Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is series parallel DC circuit analysis. Our objective is to examine electrical properties of series parallel DC circuits and learn to perform a series parallel DC circuit analysis. It is presumed the viewer has ample experience with Ohm's law and the power equations, series DC circuit analysis, including Kirchhoff's voltage law and the voltage divider rule, and parallel DC circuit analysis, including Kirchhoff's current law and the current divider rule. If there is the slightest hesitancy on your part regarding any of these topics, go away. and Do not come back until you have mastered these subjects. If you feel you are among the worthy, let us begin this lecture with a review of exclusively series and exclusively parallel properties. Current through elements in series is the same. Any and all elements hooked in line or in series with one another form a single path through which all current must necessarily pass. Kirchhoff's voltage law is an especially useful circuit analysis technique for series paths, which states for any closed loop, the sum of voltage rises equals the sum of voltage drops. Or stated more simply, what goes up must come down. Series circuit analysis additionally employs a handy shortcut called the voltage divider rule. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. Voltage is a two-point measurement. Any and all elements hooked side by side or in parallel with one another to the same two points will experience the same voltage differential. Kirchhoff's current law is an especially useful circuit analysis technique for elements or paths in parallel, which states that the sum of currents entering a node will equal the sum of currents leaving a node, or stated more simply, what goes in must come out. Parallel AC circuit analysis additionally employs a handy shortcut called the current divider rule. Finally, it needs to be emphasized that Ohm's law and the power equations work all the time. Finally, finally, power in equals power out. As brief as this list may be, I have nothing new to teach you. The rest is just party tricks. It needs to be said that I teach series parallel circuit analysis a little differently than your average textbook, principally because your average textbook teaches series parallel circuit analysis so poorly. If you do what your textbook is telling you to do, you will waste time and you'll most likely get a wrong answer. If you do what I'm telling you to do, not only will you save time and get a correct answer, you'll look super cool doing it. The choice is yours. My general advice is twofold. One, oftentimes series parallel circuit analysis is traditionally taught using the reduce and return approach. Do not reduce and return. It is a waste of time and effort to simplify a series parallel circuit into a single total resistance and then bushwhack backwards, hoping you'll arrive at your intended destination without having lost something along the way. My preferred technique is to simplify the circuit of interest into one of two configurations, either a purely series simplification or a purely parallel simplification, and then apply pure series or pure parallel properties to the simplification. Any further reduction in simplicity to a single total resistance is like taking your car apart to look for a quarter you lost under the seat. Just look under the seat. As an example of the senselessness of the reduced and return technique, consider a series parallel circuit consisting of three elements. It looks like R2 and R3 are in a parallel relationship between nodes B and C, and they can be taken in parallel with one another, a simplification I'm calling R single prime. Stop here. It's a pure series circuit. Any further reduction by taking R1 in series with R single prime will only waste time and make the return trip that much longer. 2. The utility of Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law cannot be overstated. These simple and powerful techniques allow great conceptual leaps to be made during series parallel circuit analysis. In fact, let's make it a rule that you are simply not authorized to even touch your calculator until you've performed a Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law analysis for the circuit in question. Let's look at how current flows through our first example using Kirchhoff's current law. Source current must travel through R1. Then it splits into two paths, one traveling through R2, the other traveling through R3. It can be said that source current equals I1, which equals I2 plus I3. This analysis reinforces our earlier conclusion that R2 is in parallel with R3, a simplification I'm calling R single prime, where R single prime is in series with R1. Let's now look at voltage distribution within this circuit using Kirchhoff's voltage law. For this loop in red, the rise E is equal to the sum of voltage drops, where E equals V1 plus V2. Similarly, for this loop in orange, the rise E is equal to the sum of drops, 
where E equals V1 plus V3. Finally, for this loop in yellow, the rise V2 is equal to the drop V3. This analysis again confirms that R2 is in parallel with R3, a simplification I'm calling R single prime, where R single prime is in series with R1. Let's now take a close look at our pure series simplification. R1 is purely in series with R single prime. There is absolutely no need to simplify this any further. You will note the simplification still allows access to all the original nodes, A, B, and C. This isn't always the case, however it is for this particular circuit. Let's apply pure series properties to this simplification. Current through elements in series is the same. I source equals I1, which equals I single prime. Kirchhoff's voltage law, the sum of voltage rises is equal to the summation of voltage drops. For the simplification, E equals V1 plus V single prime. It's now a simple matter of performing pure series circuit analysis of the simplified circuit, and then mapping these properties back to our original series parallel circuit. Let's do so in a staged manner. As an exercise to the viewer, I invite you to solve for V1, V single prime, I source, I1, and I single prime for the series simplification only. Once you've got these values, we'll map the properties back to our original series parallel circuit. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. First, the parallel combination of R2 and R3 results in simplification R single prime of having a value of 291.7 ohms. There are several ways to obtain the desired figures. Given this is a pure series circuit, perhaps the easiest and most direct means of doing so is through the use of the voltage divider rule. An application of the voltage divider rule demonstrates that V1 equals 12.7 volts. An algebraic rearrangement of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for the series circuit simplification demonstrates that V single prime will be the remaining 12.3 volts. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that I1 equals 42.3 milliamperes. Given this is a pure series circuit, we can say source current and I single prime are also 42.3 milliamperes. Now that we've solved for the electrical properties of the series simplification, all we need to do is map these properties back to the original series parallel circuit. We've already solved for the electrical properties of R1 and source current, where source current is 42.3 milliamperes, V1 is 12.7 volts, and I1 is 42.3 milliamperes. Given simplification R single prime between nodes B and C is in fact the parallel combination of R2 and R3, it can be said that V2 and V3 are also 12.3 volts. Why? Because voltage across elements in parallel is the same. We can now use these voltage values to solve for the current through each individual element. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that I2 equals 24.6 milliamperes. Similarly, an application of Ohm's law demonstrates that I3 equals 17.6 milliamperes. As a means of checking our work, you will note that the summation of I2 and I3 equals 42.3 milliamperes, i.e. the amount of incoming current at node B and the amount of outgoing current at node C. What goes in does indeed come out. Given these values, all we need to do now is solve for power. P1 equals V1 times I1. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates R1 dissipates 535.6 milliwatts of power. P2 equals V2 squared over R2. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates R2 dissipates 303.8 milliwatts of power. Finally, P3 equals I3 squared times R3. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates R3 dissipates 217 milliwatts of power. Total power equals P1 plus P2 plus P3. Substituting our calculated values yields 1.1 watts. As a means of checking our work, total power is also equal to supply voltage times source current, which similarly yields 1.1 watts. As an additional means of checking our work, if you are foolish enough to waste your time calculating the total resistance seen by the source by taking R1 in series with a parallel combination of R2 and R3, our simplified resistor R single prime, we would have found total resistance to be roughly 591.7 ohms. Similarly, an application of Ohm's law solving for total resistance, where total resistance is equal to supply voltage over source current, also yields a total resistance of 591.7 ohms. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our answers are correct. Before we move on, take a moment to reflect not upon the minute details of calculation, but rather the level of organization we use to solve for the desired properties of the series parallel circuit. Sometimes we use series properties. Sometimes we use parallel properties but at no point did we lose critical data or backtrack and second guess ourselves. At all times, we were aware of our goals and those pieces of knowledge leading to those goals. We took an inventory of what we did know 
and used items in this inventory to quickly arrive and confirm our results. As a result, we got the correct results the first time in the quickest manner possible. This is the standard of success. Circuit analysis at its core is an understanding of the fundamental properties of those circuits under inspection and putting them to use in an organized fashion. For series circuits, these properties are as follows. Current through elements in series is the same. Kirchhoff's voltage law. For any closed loop, the sum of voltage rises equals the sum of voltage drops. Or stated more simply, what goes up must come down. For parallel circuits, these properties are as follows. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. Kirchhoff's current law, which states the sum of currents entering a node will equal the sum of currents leaving a node. Or stated more simply, what goes in must come out. When you get right down to it, series parallel circuit analysis is simply the determination of what's in series and what's in parallel, then applying the appropriate properties to the appropriate simplifications. This is admittedly not an easy task at first and does take some practice to become adept and efficient. Believe me, you will get plenty of practice. Everything from this point on is series parallel circuit analysis. Beyond a knowledge of these fundamental series and parallel properties and an aptitude for calculation, one must be systematic and organized. My advice is to write the intermediate simplifications results down. That way you can always return to these values at later points to check your work. Use the history in your calculator. Only round the final answer. Use unrounded numbers for all calculation purposes. Keep track of where you are and at the very least, know where you're supposed to be going. Use different permutations of equations to solve for the same property as a means to check in your work. Moving on. While we've got the values for this circuit right in front of us, and before we attempt another illustrated example, let's quickly discuss the influence of opens and shorts in series parallel circuits. Let's use these expected values as a basis of comparison for this discussion. If you recall, an open in a series circuit opens the complete circuit and no current can flow. Whereas a short in a series circuit removes the shorted element from consideration. Conversely, an open in a parallel circuit removes the open element from consideration, whereas a short in a parallel circuit shorts out the entire circuit. With this knowledge, it's easy to come up with general guidance about opens and shorts and more complicated series parallel circuits. This guidance being, it depends. It depends where the open or short occurs. For example, consider an open circuit between R1 and the parallel combination of R2 and R3. This type of open has disrupted current flow through the whole system. No current flows through and no voltage is dropped across any individual element. All voltage will be dropped across this open. In this case, the gaping hole between R1 and the parallel combination of R2 and R3. Opens in series parallel circuits needn't be as dramatic. Consider one lead of R2 dangling out in space. R2 has been effectively removed from this circuit. However, current continues to flow through R1 and R3, now in a series configuration. The opening of R2 has fundamentally changed the nature of the series parallel circuit and all of our previous analyses are invalid. No current flows through R2 and no voltage will be dropped across it. An application of the voltage divider rule demonstrates that V1 will be 7.5 volts. An algebraic rearrangement of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for this now series circuit demonstrates that V3 will be the remaining 17.5 volts. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that I1 will be 25 milliamperes. Given this is now a series circuit, source current and I3 will also equal 25 milliamperes. Again, the opening of R2 has fundamentally changed the nature of the series parallel circuit and all of our previous analysis is invalid. Shorts inside series parallel circuits can also fundamentally change the nature of the series parallel circuit in question. Consider a short across the leads of R3. Not only is this shorted out R3, it's also shorted out R2, i.e. the complete parallel combination of R2 and R3 has been effectively removed from consideration as all current will be routed around it through the low resistance short. Current continues to flow through R1 and R1 only. The short has fundamentally changed the nature of this series parallel circuit and all of our previous analyses are invalid. R2 and R3 experience no current and no voltage drop. All voltage will be dropped across resistor R1 and as such it will experience 83.3 milliamperes of current. Given one element remains in the system, source current will also be 83.3 milliamperes. 
Again, the short has fundamentally changed the nature of the series parallel circuit in question, and all of our previous analyses are invalid. Long story short, it depends upon the nature and the location of the open or short. In every scenario, you will again note that the open or short has fundamentally changed the nature of the circuit, and this change may render all of our previous analyses invalid. All right, let's try another illustrated example of series parallel circuit analysis. All right, let's try another illustrated example of series parallel circuit analysis. Consider another series parallel circuit, also consisting of three elements. As an exercise to the viewer, I invite you to perform a Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of this system and see if you can recommend how one might simplify this circuit into either a pure series or a pure parallel configuration. Note, you are not authorized to use a calculator. Put the calculator down, put your hands on your head, and walk away from the calculator slowly. Listen to what I'm asking. I'm asking you to perform a Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of this system and see if you can recommend how one might simplify the circuit into either a pure series or a pure parallel configuration. Visualize how current flows through this system. Where does current split? Where does current rejoin? Where does current remain the same? Think about how voltage drops are apportioned in this system as one travels closed loops within it. Take note of the nodes, A, B, and C. Voltage is a two-point measurement. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Let's first take a look at how current flows through the system using Kirchhoff's current law. Source current leaves the positive terminal of the source and immediately splits into two paths. I'll call the path on the left I single prime and the path on the right I3. It can be said source current equals I single prime plus I3. Look at branch current I single prime. It looks like I single prime travels through both R1 and R2 in a series relationship. Current through elements in series is the same. It can be said that I single prime equals I1, which equals I2. This analysis implies R1 is in series with R2. This series combination of two elements is in parallel with R3. Let's now look at voltage distribution within this same example using Kirchhoff's voltage law. For this loop in red, the rise E is equal to the sum of voltage drops. E equals V1 plus V2. Similarly, for this loop in orange, the rise E is equal to the sum of voltage drops. E equals V3. Finally, for this loop in yellow, the rise V1 plus V2 is equal to the drop V3. This analysis again implies that R1 is in series with R2. This series combination is in parallel with R3. These analyses imply that R1 and R2 can be taken in series with one another, a simplification I'm calling R single prime. Stop right here. It's a pure parallel circuit. Any further simplification by taking R single prime in parallel with R3 will only waste time and make the return trip that much longer. You'll note in this simplification, we've lost access to node B. This being said, we've still got access to A and C. This is another clear indicator that we can apply pure parallel circuit properties to this system. Voltage is a two-point measurement. The series combination of R1 and R2 between A and C is in parallel with R3, also between A and C. Let's perform an analysis of this system in a staged manner. You are now allowed to pick up your calculator. As an exercise of the viewer, I invite you to solve for V single prime, V3, source current, I single prime, and I3 for the parallel simplification only. Once we've got these values, we'll map these properties back to our original series parallel circuit. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. For the pure parallel simplification, E equals V single prime, which equals V3, and they all equal 38 volts. Kirchhoff's current law. For the pure parallel simplification, source current is equal to I single prime plus I3. First, the series combination of R1 and R2 results in simplification R single prime having a value of 1.2 kilo ohms. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. V single prime and V3 equal 38 volts. Perhaps the easiest and most direct means of solving for the other properties is through the use of Ohm's law, where I single prime is equal to V single prime over R single prime. Substituting your given values demonstrates that I single prime is 31.7 milliamperes. Similarly, I3 is equal to V3 over R3. Substituting your given values demonstrates I3 to be 27.1 milliamperes. 
Source current is equal to I single prime plus I3. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates source current is 58.8 milliampers. Now that we've solved for the electrical properties of the pure parallel simplification, all we need to do now is map these properties back to our original series parallel circuit. This time it's your turn. See if you can take the results of the pure parallel simplification and use them to determine the electrical properties of R1, R2, and R3 in the original series parallel circuit. Some properties may necessitate further calculations, some properties might be readily available with minimal effort. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. We already solved for source current, where source current is 58.8 milliampers. Additionally, we already solved for the electrical properties of R3, where V3 is 38 volts and I3 is 27.1 milliampers. All we need to do now is map the properties of R single prime back to the series combination of R1 and R2. Given the simplification R single prime between nodes A and C is in fact the series combination of R1 and R2, it can be said that I2 and I1 are also 31.7 milliampers. Why? Because current through elements in series is the same. We can now use Ohm's law to solve for voltage across each individual element in this series path. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V1 will be equal to 25.3 volts. Similarly, an application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V2 is the remaining 12.7 volts. As a means of checking our work, you will note the summation of voltage drops V1 and V2 equals 38 volts, i.e. the voltage rise between nodes A and C. What goes up has indeed come down. All we need to do now is solve for power. As an exercise to the viewer, I invite you to solve for power dissipated by each individual element and total power. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. P1 equals V1 times I1. Substituting our given values, it's 802.2 milliwatts. P2 equals V2 squared over R2. Substituting our given values, yields 401.1 milliwatts. P3 equals I3 squared times R3. Substituting our given values, yields 1 watt. Total power is equal to P1 plus P2 plus P3. Substituting our calculated values, yields 2.2 watts. As a means of checking our work, total power is equal to supply voltage times source current, which similarly yields 2.2 watts. As an additional means of checking our work, if you are foolish enough to waste your time calculating the total resistance seen by the source by taking the series combination of R1 and R2, our simplified resistor R single prime, in parallel with R3, you would have found total resistance to be roughly 646.1 ohms. Similarly, an application of Ohm's law solving for total resistance, where total resistance is equal to supply voltage over source current, also yields a total resistance of roughly 646.2 ohms. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our answers are correct. While we've got the values for this original series parallel circuit in front of us, let's use them as a basis of comparison for another discussion about the influence of opens and shorts in series parallel circuits. Consider an open circuit between R1 and R2. How will this affect the electrical properties of the elements in this system? In what way has this changed the circuit? Here's another challenge. Consider a low resistance short around R2. How will this affect the electrical properties of the remaining elements in the system? In what way has this changed our circuit? As an exercise the viewer, I invite you to determine the voltage across and the current through the individual elements in these modified circuits. As a general rule, opens and shorts have fundamentally changed the nature of the original series parallel circuit and most likely, all of our previous analysis is invalid. You simply must begin again because nothing is as it once was. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The open between R1 and R2 has effectively severed the left branch of the original series parallel circuit. No current flows through R1 nor R2, and neither of these resistors will experience a voltage drop. R3, however, continues chugging along, experiencing a 38 volt drop and 27.1 milliampers of current. Given R3 is the only remaining element in this system, source current drops to 27.1 milliampers. The short around 2 has effectively removed R2 from consideration as all current will be routed around it. R2 experiences no voltage drop. Only R1 in the left branch presents opposition to supply voltage. By shorting out R2, we have effectively placed R1 and R3 perfectly in parallel with one another. R1 experiences a 38 volt drop and draws 47.5 milliampers of current. R3 continues chugging along, experiencing a 38 volt drop and 27.1 milliampers of current. Source current rises to 47.5 plus 27.1, .1, 
or 74.6 milliampers of current. All right, one last example. Let's turn up the heat. Consider this series parallel circuit consisting of five elements. Now don't freak out. Let's again go about this in a staged manner. Put your calculator down for the moment and listen to what I'm asking you to do first. See if you can perform a Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of this system and recommend how one might simplify the circuit into either a pure series or a pure parallel configuration. Note this particular circuit may take more than one simplification step to arrive at a pure series or pure parallel configuration. Again, my advice is to visualize how current flows through the system. Where does current split? Where does current rejoin? Where does current remain the same? Think about how voltage drops are apportioned in this system as one travels closed loops within it. Use the nodes. Voltage is a two-point measurement. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Source current leaves the positive terminal of the source and must travel through R1. Source current equals I1. Current that splits into two paths. I'll call the path on the left I single prime and the path on the right I4. It can be said source current equals I1, which equals I single prime plus I4. Look at branch current I single prime. It looks like I single prime travels both through R2 and R3 in a series fashion. Current through elements in series is the same. It can be said that I single prime equals I2, which equals I3. This implies R2 is in series with R3. This series combination of two elements is in parallel with R4. Finally, I single prime and I4 rejoin at node D and travel through R5. It can be said source current equals I1, which equals I single prime plus I4, which equals I5. Let's now look at voltage distribution within the circuit using Kirchhoff's voltage law. For this loop in red, the rise E is equal to the sum of voltage drops, where E equals V1 plus V2 plus V3 plus V5. Similarly, for the loop in orange, the rise E is equal to the sum of voltage drops, where E equals V1 plus V4 plus V5. Finally, for this loop in yellow, the rise V2 plus V3 is equal to the drop V4. This again implies R2 is in series with R3, and this series combination is in parallel with R4. As a first simplification, R2 and R3 can be taken in series with one another, a simplification I'm calling R single prime, where R single prime is in parallel with R4. You will note this simplification with lost access to node C. This isn't a pure series, nor a pure parallel circuit, so we need to simplify it further. As a second simplification, R single prime and R4 can be taken in parallel with one another, a simplification I'm calling R double prime, where R double prime is in series with R1 and R5. Stop right here. It's a pure series circuit. Any further simplification will only waste time and make the return trip that much longer. Let's perform the analysis of this system in a staged manner. You are now allowed to pick up your calculator. As an exercise, the viewer I invite you to solve for V1, V double prime, V5, source current, I1, I double prime, and I5 for the pure series simplification only. Once we've got these values, we'll map these properties back to our first simplification and then back to the original series parallel circuit. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should obtain the following results. First, the series combination of R2 and R3 results in simplification R single prime having a value of 710 ohms. Next, the parallel combination of R single prime and R4 results in simplification R double prime having a value of 313.1 ohms. An application of Kirchhoff's current law to the pure series simplification demonstrates source current equals I1, which equals I double prime, which equals I5. An application of Kirchhoff's voltage law to the pure series simplification demonstrates that E equals V1 plus V double prime plus V5. There are several ways to obtain the desired figures. Given this is a pure series circuit, perhaps the easiest and most direct means of doing so is through the use of the voltage divider rule. Application of the voltage divider rule demonstrates that V1 equals 10 volts. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that I1 equals 49.8 milliamperes. Given this simplification is a pure series circuit, we could say I source, I double prime, and I5 are also 49.8 milliamperes. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V double prime equals 15.6 volts. Finally, an algebraic manipulation of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for the series circuit simplification 
demonstrates that V5 is the remaining 16.4 volts. Now that we've solved for the electrical properties for the pure series simplification, we need to map these properties back to our first simplification. See if you can take the results of pure series simplification and use them to determine the electrical properties of R1, R2, R single prime, and R5 in the first simplification. Some properties may necessitate further calculations. However, some properties might be readily available with minimum effort. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. We already solved for the electrical properties of R1, R5, and source current. These remain unchanged. Source current is 49.8 milliampers, V1 is 10 volts, I1 is 49.8 milliampers, V5 is 16.4 volts, and I5 is also 49.8 milliampers. Given the simplification, R double prime is in fact the parallel combination of R single prime and R4. It can be said that V single prime and V4 are also 15.6 volts. Why? Because voltage across elements in parallel is the same. We can now use these voltage values for V single prime and V4 to solve for current through each parallel path. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that I single prime will be 22 milliampers. Similarly, an application of Ohm's law demonstrates that I4 will be 27.9 milliampers. As a means of checking our work, you will note that the summation of I single prime and I4 equals 49.8 milliampers, i.e., the amount of incoming current at node B and the amount of outgoing current at node D. What goes in does indeed come out. Almost there. Now that we've solved the electrical properties for the first simplification, we need to map these properties back to our original series parallel circuit. Really, there's only a few missing holes. Some properties may necessitate further calculations. However, some properties might be readily available with minimum effort. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Given simplification, R single prime is in fact the series combination of R3 and R4. It can be said that I3 and I4 also equal 22 milliampers. Why? Because current through elements in series is the same. Now that we know current through these two individual elements, we can use Ohm's law to solve for a voltage drop across each individual element in this series path. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V2 equals 10.3 volts. Similarly, an application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V3 is the remaining 5.3 volts. As a means of checking our work, you'll note the summation of the voltage drops V2 plus V3 equals 15.6 volts, i.e. the voltage rise between node A and D. What goes up has indeed come down. In summary, source current equals 49.8 milliampers, V1 equals 10 volts, I1 equals 49.8 milliampers, V2 equals 10.3 volts, I2 equals 22 milliampers, V3 equals 5.3 volts, I3 equals 22 milliampers, V4 equals 15.6 volts, I4 equals 27.9 milliampers, V5 equals 16.4 volts, and I5 equals 49.8 milliampers. All we need to do now is solve for power. By all means, pause the lecture and try this by yourself. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following values. Presented without comment, you should have observed the following. P1 equals 496.4 milliwatts. P2 equals 226.8 milliwatts. P3 equals 115.8 milliwatts. P4 equals 434.4 milliwatts. And finally, P5 equals 819 milliwatts. Power total equals P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 plus P5. Substituting our calculated values yields 2.1 watts. As a means of checking our work, supply voltage times source current does indeed yield 2.1 watts. As an additional means of checking our work, if you are foolish enough to waste your time calculating the total resistance seen by the source, you would have found total resistance to be roughly 843.1 ohms. Similarly, an application of Ohm's law solving for total resistance where total resistance is equal to supply voltage over source current also yields a total resistance of 843.1 ohms. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our answers are correct. Alright, that was rough. Let's take a break. Just kidding, sit your butt down and finish this. There's only a couple minutes in this lecture remaining. While we've got the values for this series parallel circuit in front of us, let's use them as a basis of comparison for a discussion not about shorts and opens as previously, but rather about nodal voltages in series parallel circuits. Given this circuit is ground referenced, see if you can use Kirchhoff's voltage law to determine the following single subscript nodal voltages all with respect to ground, VA, VB, VC, and VD. Note there are plenty of loops to travel within this circuit in plenty of different directions, but as long as you remain consistent with polarity, 
you should get workable results. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Starting at the ground reference negative terminal and traveling in the clockwise direction, we first encounter a 42 volt rise. A is clearly 42 volts higher than ground. Continuing to travel from A to B, we experience a 10 volt drop. It stands to conjecture B is a rise of 42, less a drop of 10, or 32 volts higher than ground. Continuing to travel from B to C, we experience a 10.3 volt drop. It stands to conjecture C is a rise of 42, less a drop of 10, less another drop of 10.3 volts, or 21.7 volts higher than ground. Continuing to travel from C to D, we experience a 5.3 volt drop. It stands to conjecture D is a rise of 42, less a drop of 10, less another drop of 10.3, less another drop of 5.3, or 16.4 volts higher than ground. Finally completing the loop, traveling from D to ground, we're back at where we started. This Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis suggests that with respect to ground, VA equals 42 volts, VB equals 32 volts, VC equals 21.7 volts, and VD equals 16.4 volts. As long as you remain consistent with polarity, alternate loops in alternate directions should yield identical results. All right, that's about it for this set of illustrated example problems. As I mentioned earlier, everything from this point on is series parallel circuit analysis. The only way to get good is plenty of practice. It won't be easy at first, but trust me, the more you struggle with these skills, the easier they'll become. In conclusion, this lecture reviewed basic series and basic parallel DC circuit properties and put them to use in several illustrated examples of series parallel DC circuit analysis. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.